Uh, good afternoon. My name is Andrew. I'm a SRE on the telemetry team within Bloomberg. Uh, this presentation will be a collection of stories that describe our experiences as we moved from mostly proprietary software uh, to finding a balance with deploying open source where applicable within our pipeline, uh, specifically the telemetry pipeline. To give some background and to better understand the challenges uh, we were facing and the changes we were making, we'll start with a brief overview of Bloomberg as a product and a company, uh, then journey then onto our journey with deploying open source within telemetry, following with discussions of some of the challenges we faced, and save some time for questions and comments. Uh, hopefully some of our lessons learned may be helpful to others. So here's a quick spiel. Uh, founded in 1981 by Mike Bloomberg, our products include TV, radio, magazine, web products, and the Bloomberg terminal. The terminal that you see is displayed of many different applications. There's like ten, tens of thousands of different products that operate mostly independently, it delivers real-time news, market data, messaging, and analytics. Uh, I mention all of this mainly to demonstrate that the telemetry team provides a monitoring platform for users across the company to gain insight into how these services are behaving. Um, you can stop by your booth for a demo. And speaking of subscribers, we have over 325,000 across the globe. Um, Bloomberg as a whole processes a lot of large amount of data in real time. And equally interesting is that with over 20,000 employees, engineers account for over 25% of the company, and these are our primary users of the telemetry service. So telemetry at Bloomberg, which is the team that I am on, our mission is to improve the stability of the infrastructure and applications by providing a platform for our metric and log data. To do so, we collect, process, store, visualize, and provide alerting of log and metric time series data. This service we provide is relied upon across the organization. A look at some of our ingestion stats. Uh, these were from a month ago, so they're probably a little bit higher now. But we process over 6 million metrics per second with over 200 million active time series and 4,000 metric rules. Uh, with logs, we process over 7 million lines per second. That's 130 terabytes of daily data across multiple stores. We have over 20,000 log rules processing at a rate of 100 million regexes per second. And the web interface, which is how the majority of our users access and interact with their data, sees over 2,000 unique users a week, and we have over 3,000 saved dashboards. So our journey with deploying open source. Uh, for this portion, we'll focus on the metrics collection within Bloomberg. This was one of the first major components that we replaced in an environment while moving from proprietary to open source. Uh, we'll rewind back to 2016, and during that time we had the following. There were over 20 proprietary and independent systems for metrics collection. Uh, these systems were created and managed by isolated teams, each with a focus on solving a subset of problems facing their specific area of responsibilities and expertise. Uh, but most importantly, it worked and it provided a valuable resource. Uh, there were some limitations, including the following. There was little correlation of metrics between different systems. This stemmed from each team having their own uh, data sources and their own telemetry stack. Metrics were domain-specific with various restrictions, like network, application, OS, and security. Uh, there was plenty of overlap with multiple teams having different methods of collecting similar data. And during the course of the 38 years that Bloomberg as an organization has been around, there's been a lot of code introduced throughout that time span with a wide mix of languages used to implement it. Many of these legacy code also had dependencies on Bloomberg infrastructure. Um, so our team goal, our mission was to improve the stability of Bloomberg infrastructure and applications by providing a telemetry platform. We needed to provide a centralized and unified service, and that was our priority. Uh, since our users span the company with varying technical background and the ratio of thousands of users to our team, which cons consists of just the handful of people, we needed to ensure the ease of onboarding, uh, so something like a self-service portal where users can get set up on their own would be beneficial. We also wanted to provide a highly visible and stable infrastructure with APIs for enabling programmatic interactions with the data. Uh, another requirement we had was that whatever we deployed, we should be able to scale linearly so that as ingestion grows, we could just throw more hardware into the mix. And because we were essentially monitoring the entirety of Bloomberg infrastructure and services, we wanted to limit our dependency on core infrastructure as much as possible. This was done with the reasoning that we could be more resilient and available during incidents uh, affecting services which we, which, with which we were monitoring. 
And this led us to open source, uh, to leverage open source. At the time, time series databases were gaining popularity, so there were a lot of options. We identified the option that best met our scale of ingestion. Uh, we spent engineering time to research and ramp up our understanding of how the software worked. And we collaborated with the project maintainer and became pretty active with the project community. We spent time to understand also the dependencies, their roles, and how to best implement and debug it. For example, there was Zookeeper, Hadoop, HBase, and Kafka, all of which were new to us and the team at the time. After benchmark and tests were completed, we were confident in the solution. We deployed this to stage and production and began to deprecate the legacy system. Many of the individual teams were happy that they did not need to deploy their own telemetry stack anymore, and users across the company were able to access their data in a collaborative manner. And then soon thereafter, we began leveraging open source uh, throughout elsewhere in the pipeline. So as time went on, over the course of two years in production, we were able to experience new limitations with our time series infrastructure. Uh, these limitations presented itself as our usage increased and the user patterns changed. It became clear that we had gaps with our requirements and what was available with the current deployment. Our main limitation was that since the time series database did not utilize cache, we were constantly uh, querying HBase. The bottleneck resulted in frequent timeouts when users tried to retrieve metrics either from the API or the web interface. So we tried to best to understand what we were trying to solve before coming up with a solution. And of course, there's always more. Uh, we had the same initial requirements as back in 2016, where we wanted to scale linearly and be independent from core infrastructure. However, now we wanted to implement a caching layer to reduce read timeouts. Uh, caching data and memory would also require compression, and we wanted the ability to provide rollups. If we could compartmentalize and have a drop-in replacement into our existing metrics pipeline, that would be ideal, uh, with a seamless transition to the users already relying on our service. So this time we went down two paths. Um, last time we knew we wanted open source. Um, this time we had a portion of the team uh, to begin developing our own version of a time series database. Um, a separate part of the team was also uh, simultaneously serving the open source options that have come out since our initial research two years prior. Uh, based on our requirements, we narrowed down our options and we proceeded with Metric Tank, which is open sourced. It is inspired by the Facebook Gorilla paper where heavily compressed chunks dramatically lower CPU, memory, and storage requirements. It serves most, memory, most data out of memory and provided rollups. Does anybody here use Metric Tank, by the way? No? All right. This was mostly a drop-in replacement. The query syntax differed between the two solutions as this would use Graphite uh, query syntax and the previous version did not. This means that our existing dashboards, which we had thousands of, would be invalid. Uh, so instead of having users convert their dashboard, we automated the conversions for them and replaced it. This way, as we replaced the whole time series component, the experience of the users was unnoticeable, aside from increased performance and reliability. We also spent time learning how it worked and any dependencies that were new to us again. Um, this time, uh, we had to learn about Cassandra, Go, and Kubernetes. So with that, we stopped writing our own time series database. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so here's a simplified view of our current metrics pipeline. Our overall telemetry pipeline has a lot more moving pieces, but this is just the metrics part uh, scaled down. We have local agents on all of our machines. There's like tens of thousands of machines which publish data to our Kafka cluster. Workers are subscribed, processes that data, applying rules and triggering handlers. Based on the processing, the data is then used later in the stack. Uh, for metrics, it is sent to our new backend, which caches in memory and writes to Cassandra. Users are able to view the metrics a few ways, and one of which is through the Grafana web UI. We also deploy a lot of in-house developed software. Um, all of our workers, which are subscribed to Kafka, are all in-house. We try to find a balance of when to use open source, because there's always trade-offs either way. Um, an example is the stats collection daemon that we deploy to all of our machines. We initially used CollectD as it uh, covered most of our use cases. Our operating systems consist of AIX, Solaris, Unix, uh, Linux, and Windows. But with CollectD not supporting Windows, we created our own and open sourced it. Uh, the version's called CollectD Win. Um, however, we also ran into other conflicts such as metrics discrepancies, um, basically with the metrics that was being provided from CollectD versus the metrics that we were uh, receiving on our own. Uh, there was a, a little bit of a variance. 
specifically, like a lot of the, the Sun CPU metrics were, uh, there was discrepancy between the two. So we decided it'd be more beneficial if we moved off Collect-D and in turn we were on our own collector uh, for that and many other reasons that we deployed to all of our machines. So what did we learn? We tried to fully understand our use case and what we're trying to solve. Doing so helped us filter and narrow down our viable options and avoid being swayed by what's trending at the moment. There's a lot of software, um, especially new and like hyped up software that naturally we would love to experiment with. But um, having a clear understanding of what we're trying to solve help us focus and stay on point. We routinely, we routinely revisit our decisions based on our usage patterns as patterns and requirements change. Um, a decision based on like a particular point in time will likely be having a different result if uh, the same decisions were given at a later point in time. Software we deploy should be interchangeable. An example of a similar exercise we're currently doing is when reading data from Cassandra, we were run into the issue of delays during garbage collection. Uh, since Cassandra is written in Java, and with that you have garbage collection, as the JVM handles keeping track of which objects are in use even if the object is no longer needed. Cassandra queries all the nodes in the cluster, so no matter how fast the machines are, uh, we were as slow as our slowest, we were only as fast as our slowest node. We wanted another database that functions similar to Cassandra, but without the impact of garbage collection, um, so we wouldn't see the timeouts as often. This led us to ScyllaDB, which we are now experimenting with. It's a re-implementation of Cassandra written in C++, with the goal of increasing raw performance as a drop-in replacement. Also, onboarding should be streamlined so that engineers can build, test, and validate, but also make it flexible enough that we can still experiment and promote best practices. Uh, my, Sean, my colleague Sean would always say, APIs enforce consistency while documentation explains it. So let's discuss some more scenarios of challenges where we ran into and how we attempt to resolve them. Evolution of our infrastructure is probably a more accurate description. Um, let's look back at our metrics pipeline diagram. You can see that for the application cluster, which operates our rules, processing, and handlers, these workers are deployed onto a Kubernetes cluster. Similarly, with our metrics backend, also being on Kubernetes in a different cluster. Uh, in actuality, uh, this consists of multiple isolated clusters. We have staging and production, and then within each, uh, they're segmented down into like different regions and locations. When we first started deploying to these clusters, our process consisted of a mix of pushing YAML manifests using Chef, uh, followed by a human logging in to each cluster and running kubectl apply, um, watching it deploy, watching some graphs, waiting 10, 15 minutes, doing the next one, and uh, looping over and over again. Um, often these steps would be after you updated and rebuilt your Docker container from the application itself. Um, now throwing the fact that sometimes we had services running on both the metrics backend and the application worker cluster, um, this had the potential of an engineer sitting there and loop th looping through this whole deploy process nearly 10 times, often just for like a minor manifest change. Many times, this is what it felt like. That's the code going out. Uh, needless to say, this was less than ideal, and we needed a better way of deploying our applications. Like that guy almost got hit. Uh, a deploy process that was automated and less prone to human error with an audit trail so that we can see what changed and when is what something, was something that we wanted. This took a few iterations as we also took the opportunity to standardize our software development lifecycle. Uh, focusing on just the deployment portion, we pulled in Spinnaker and Helm. Spinnaker, was, which is created on Netflix, is a continuous delivery platform which emphasizes fast, safe, and repeatable deployments. Helm is a chart manager, which is a package of Kubernetes resources, essentially your YAML manifests. Combined, we use Spinnaker to manage deployments in Helm to templatize and render our manifest, as settings often vary even for the same application across the different clusters. So today, when any of the 40 plus applications are updated that we deploy to Kubernetes, um, upon, each pull upon each pull request merge, a webhook is sent to Spinnaker. That webhook and its payload consistent of environment variables uh, passed from the PR will dictate which application to deploy, along with uh, which cluster uh, do you want to deploy to all the clusters, the subset of the clusters, and at what interval. Um, at each stage, the deploy will send a webhook back to the originating PR so that we can post updates on how the deploy process is going. 
Uh, this way, with the PR, you have a full ledger, a single source to view the code, the directives for deployment, and the status of the deploy through each stage. This led us to a fully automated deploy once the PR has been merged. Uh, so next up, we'll talk about scheduling Kubernetes pods. A little bit of background. As shown earlier in our metrics pipeline diagram, we have a dedicated cluster to support our time series backend. We, Cassandra, we have deployed as a stateful set, which is one per machine. Uh, it uses physical disk from a node and little memory. Metric tank is a series of multiple deployments. It uses no disk, however, more memory as it caches recent time frame of data and, yeah, time frame of metrics. And because Cassandra uses more disk, and less memory, while metric tank uses no disk and more memory, uh, we figured co-locating them on the same cluster would be a good fit. Just a note is that metric tank consists of reader and writer pods. Writer pods read from Kafka partitions, it writes to memory, and then it flushes to Cassandra at uh, scheduled intervals. Reader pods, when starting up, it reads from Cassandra and backfills its data, filling up its cache before passing its ready and liveness checks. So the problem is these readers and writers are very memory and CPU intensive during startup as it backfills its cache. We experienced that the Kubernetes default scheduler, it would bind pods to the least resource node as expected, and that's usually what we want. But in this instance, it posed a problem. Uh, for example, either doing deployments or when a new Kubernetes node comes back online, which can be from maintenance or just expanding the cluster, the default scheduler would assign the new pods to the unused node. And then once, once multiple metric tank pods start up and begin to backfill its data into memory, the pods quickly overload to the node. Uh, we will see many failures from out of memory and low skyrocketing and the nodes just being unresponsive anymore. The pod won't pass its ready and liveness checks until the backfill for the pod is complete. And then the resources used during startup versus normal operating state had a wide variance. We did some research to better understand how the Kubernetes scheduler works. Uh, there are two main cycles for the pod scheduling context. Uh, the ones we focus on were filtering and scoring. Filtering returns a set of suitable nodes where it's possible to schedule a pod. Uh, for example, nodes with enough memory, uh, disk and PIDs, like its resources, and nodes with suitable volumes available. Scoring ranks the candidates of filter nodes to choose who are most suitable for that pod placement. This can be favoring nodes with fewer requested resources and favoring nodes based on pod affinity and anti-affinity rules. Um, that's just a couple examples. There's obviously a bunch more. And in the end, the scheduler assigns a pod to the node with the highest rank, uh, which is its score. So our goal was to have a scheduler which evaluates the pods ready status and favor nodes with least ready pods, with least non-ready pods. Uh, to do that, we experimented with the custom scheduler. Kubernetes accommodates custom schedulers that run as a pod simultaneously alongside the default scheduler. This can be used as an opt-in basis by specifying it in your pod spec. This worked pretty well. We created our own custom scheduler, which implemented our own node filtering to see if a node was in a ready state, and then applied our algorithm on top of that to favor the node with the least non-ready pods. We confirmed that giving priority to nodes with less non-ready pods was beneficial to our, our, our working use case. We had a few questions, though. We weren't clear how multiple schedulers were coordinating pod assignments, and mostly we wanted to utilize the pre-existing node filtering and account for the scoring provided by the default scheduler. We began to dig into the default scheduler some more and decided to enhance it. Uh, the list of existing priorities and algorithms is uh, referenceable in that link. We forked the repo, added a new priority to favor nodes with le least non-ready pods um, before assigning a score and trying to implement it into the default scheduler. So our pull request, uh, to summarize, we used the existing framework to retrieve a list of ready nodes. And based on the node info object, we're able to get a list of pods bound to that node. For each node, we then inspect the pods. If we are able to determine if the, pod, if the node is in a ready state, are, we're able to turn the pod is in a ready state based on the details in the pod object. We then tally up the count of non-ready pods for each node, and each node is then given a score of zero through 10, where 10 is the highest priority. The score is based on the ratio of nodes non-ready pod count to the overall number of non-ready pods across the cluster. 
The score is returned to the scheduler and included in the overall score based on the default scheduler priorities. Um, Kubernetes allows you to customize default scheduler weights into scores. So in our case, we up the weight of our priority for this cluster. And then you can check out that PR if you want to see more details or leave any feedback. It's still open right now. Uh, we just submitted it recently. And then with this new policy, our cluster has not seen a recurrence of nodes getting overloaded during deployments um, of these pods, which still to this day consume a lot of memory and CPU during startup before they pass their ready and liveness checks. Uh, and finally, we'll talk about Kafka partition reassignments. So Kafka, um, you guys might already know, is a distributed streaming platform which allows you to publish and subscribe to streams of records as well as store and process those streams of records as they occur. Machines across Bloomberg uh, publish logs and metrics to Kafka, which is subscribed to by our metrics backend for ingest and processing. There are three types of Kafka traffic streams. Producer traffic, which is published to the broker, which is the node. The consumer traffic, allowing applications to subscribe to the broker. And replication traffic, uh, which is the traffic between broker to broker. As new nodes are added, these new Kafka brokers join the cluster. Partitions aren't auto-balanced, so newly joined nodes are just sitting there idle until new topics or partitions are created. Kafka provides a utility to generate a JSON of a proposed rebalanced partitions and execute it if using the provided Kafka reassigned partition script. So the problem that we experienced, when a new cluster joins a cluster, when a new broker joins a cluster, there is no auto-rebalancing. We use Kafka Manager to manage our Kafka clusters. The Kafka Manager has a UI, which, is, which also has the ability to trigger a partition rebalance job. During the addition of new brokers to the cluster, we use this feature. And in our cluster, we have many topics with large partition sizes. A side effect of the replication traffic is that during that time, producer and consumer traffic are, are impacted. Once the reassignment job was issued, there was no way to pause or cancel it. So we tried to manually remove the job assignments from Zookeeper, which is not ideal, and it didn't really work either because we would see the same jobs pop back up, reappear automatically. Brokers were being bounced and getting overloaded due to non-throttle partition reassignment traffic, and this resulted in us having a huge ingest lag where data was not flowing through our pipeline and corresponding data loss. We tested in stage, but as is in most cases, it's a smaller data set, so partition sizes were different and not as large. Data flows in through an internal cache layer in front of Kafka. And since our Kafka cluster was super slow at this point, the layer in front began to drop data from its cache. And so we were having data loss in production. And that was a perfect time to panic. Um, I'm sure there were some who thought we were running around like this in the office, but I would like to think we were a little bit more composed. But who knows? Um, eventually, it settled down. We had to stop ingestion, which allowed the Kafka brokers to, to stabilize before returning back to normal operating health. With the cluster healthy again, we knew that we needed a solution that allows us to issue partition assignments without impacting the cluster stability, regardless of partition size. We looked into the uh, previously mentioned Kafka reassignment partition script that is included within Kafka. We ended up writing a wrapper, which uh, utilized that script to generate a JSON file and then added the ability to segment the JSON into batches so that you can specify the number of partitions to process over time. Um, it is then executed sequentially in batches so they could stop and resume uh, assignments. And we would throttle reassignment throughput by default and let it be adjustable on the fly uh, as a side effect of the batching. But as we were finishing up that wrapper script, we became aware of LinkedIn's Kafka tools, which is a set of tools that LinkedIn has built over time to manage Kafka. And obviously, they are uh, more well-versed in it than we are. So with that, and that Kafka tools already had uh, batching implemented, we decided to uh, make a PR to theirs to add in uh, throttling. While in general, splitting the partitions to multiple batches will reduce the chance that brokers get over under and rebounds traffic, it's still possible for this rebalance traffic to impose pressure to brokers if the cluster is busy. So we submitted the PR. Um, an overview is that when you use Kafka, Kafka tools to manage partition reassignments, it calls out to the reassigned partition script with a limited set of flags. In our pull request, we add the throttle flag as an option. With this flag, we can set the throttle by specifying bytes per second. The default value has been configured to not throttle, which is how the tool currently operates. 
And then that PR is also still open as we just opened it as well. Um, enabling the starter flag adds another layer of protection to prevent clusters from getting overrun during rebounds workload. Lesson learned from the last few examples. Uh, deploying code should be repeatable and consistent. By automating our Kubernetes application deployment process, an engineer could continue working on other more interesting things and get notified via the pull request for updates rather than spending an afternoon uh, babysitting deployment due to the manual and redundant actions. Uh, we try to avoid making assumptions and assumptions and always verify things that we might take for granted. Uh, when testing the partition rebalance with Kafka Manager on stage, it worked. However, that was just for a small subset of data. We didn't account for the larger data size of partitions in production. Also, we expected there to be a corresponding method to stop and or cancel the Kafka partition reassignment after you initiate it, um, but that wasn't the case. And finally, by digging into the project repo and understanding how the code works, it enabled us to experiment with and provide enhancements. Um, oftentimes, other people may have already run across the same issues, or a solution might already be in the work. And just to recap, the lessons learned from our earlier discussion on how we deploy software in general. Um, it's not often that we talk about our experiences when things go wrong, so this was pretty interesting. And sometimes, as an engineer, it feels like we live in a choose-your-own-adventure type of book. Um, these were the choices we made, and hopefully by sharing our experiences, we can help each other's story be a more positive one. Um, it's likely that most of these links are already well known, but just in case, here are a few that we wanted to highlight uh, that we use regularly. And thank you. All right, thank you, Andrew. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Um, our only request is that you please use the microphone. Uh, if you ask a question or if you cannot get to the microphone, just raise your hand and I'll bring it to you. Hi, uh, great talk. Thank for you. Your first talk, great job. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you, in your diagram, you showed you have your vents coming in and Kafka is your, your ingestion mechanism. Yes. And then eventually the metrics end up in Cassandra and I guess they're cached by metrics tank. Um, then you had that black box of, you know, stuff that happens somewhere between those two layers. Could you maybe go into that a little more about like what kinds of things are you doing uh, in that, that you know, middle layer of, uh, but, but before, you know, when it comes out of Kafka, but then before it ends up in Cassandra? Um, yeah, so we do a lot of um, uh, sanitizing the data. So we get metrics from a bunch of different machines in different format. Um, so we do a lot of sanitizing. We apply rules on them based on like uh, user definable. Uh, we have a self-service portal where a user can go in, uh, register their namespace, their metric, and their tags. And based on what they provide, they can also provide rules on them. Like um, if we see multiple uh, entries of this alert, of this message come in, or this metric come in uh, over a certain amount of time, we can trigger like alerts based off of it. Um, we do, we start, we are starting to work with tracing. So that's another thing that we're also doing in there. Um, yeah, just a lot of processing. So is that rules layer, does that have uh, other open source tools built into that, or is that all custom code? Uh, that rule layer is mostly custom code. Okay, because there, I was, when you're describing that kind of stuff, I'm thinking of things like FluentD, for example, that might give you a pipeline framework to write a lot of that stuff. Yes. Have you guys looked at potentially replacing some of that custom code with the open, more open source frameworks? Yeah, we're, we're always looking. Um, our use case is a little bit like uh, specific to Bloomberg in particular, just because like we have to account for, um, has to work on all the operating systems, um, has to work across many of the applications that we run and deploy. Um, and trying to figure out how to tie it into our existing like uh, applications that the the users are writing in a seamless manner. Um, those are always like uh, top of our mind. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Uh, if there are no other questions, um, we just have a couple of room reminders um, from the. There is a break with refreshments starting at 3.30 out in the foyer here. Uh, then we will have one more set of talks from 4 p.m. to 5.30. From 6 to 8 tonight is a conference reception downstairs in the exhibit hall. And don't miss uh, the lightning talks from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. I've been promised karaoke as well. So thanks, everyone.
And thanks again, Andrew. You're welcome.